to do. And working in the government, I will say, I, I really, it was a workout, an exercise in character building. <laughs> um, you have to put up with a lot of bureaucracy. Things change very quickly. Um, I remember one day when the administration changed from Obama to Trump, one day we had funding for a specific set of initiatives and right after Trump was sworn in, the money was gone. So I had to quickly like adapt. And that's actually helped me a lot here because in that startup mentality, which is also how tech usually goes, you have to be quick to adapt to whatever changes are happening. So an initiative changes. I mean, the Olympics was postponed by an entire year. So now we're kind of shifting gears. And if I wasn't comfortable adapting, that would be really, really hard. And I think also obviously, being really interested in sports, being able to respond quickly to a change or to still be engaged and interested when something changes is really helpful. So, I mean, that was my journey. I I realized, oh, if I'm so far from what I want, how do I connect that? What is the common denominator between my skills and the environment that I want? So, Urdu, there is a question from uh, Richard Denton. Uh, Richard says, hi, Urdu. In general, how do you deal with the new privacy laws that were introduced in Europe a couple of years ago when managing personal uh, and consumer data? So we have had to deal with that uh, quite often because we want to track how people are using and consuming uh, Olympic content. And the challenge with that is that people have the right to opt out even after opting in, right? And now there's a full on process that has to be put every time someone requests that their information is removed. So that has to now be automated because it's far more frequent than it originally was. I think maybe when I started a couple months ago, we had one per month now we have about three or two per month which doesn't seem that frequent but the process is pretty lengthy because you have to request that that person's um, user information is removed and scrubbed so you have to also go through verifying that that is the user and that is their request um, for the sake of privacy so you have to really be aware of how that changes and we partner with our legal team to make sure that once we do those release notes on who has been removed from our system that it's reported back to legal so even though it's a specific case it still engages the entire organization like it engages our data team it engages our our legal team it engages our IT and tech ops team. Um, so it's multiple layers. So it's forced us to pay a lot of attention to these changes. Okay, I, uh, I do. Um, you might be able to see me now. Um, <clears throat> the basis uh, raised the question for me. That, that's a good start. Um, I was just curious as well about in terms of the, the database that the IOC uh, has at its disposal, how many um, records or how, many, uh, how much data do you actually have which is available to use in order to help serve the community, whether that's from either a commercial perspective or to encourage people to get involved in uh, IOC-related uh, projects? Um, if I just take a very simple example, um, clearly, the Olympics um, sells a lot of tickets uh, when people go to the Olympic Games and presumably a lot of tickets were sold for Tokyo 2020. But is the IOC directly or indirectly in control of the data relating to things like that? Or is that more in partnership with the ticket seller and, and suppliers that, that, that you work with uh, in, indirectly? Can you maybe give us an idea a little bit how, how that works? Yeah, so specifically for, for that, it varies. Um, and the reason why is because the countries that host have their own organizations and it depends on the legal implications for ticketing and the data 
that you are acquiring mm -hmm. for that. Also, different countries actually control the ticketing um, distribution, but receiving the ticket request is by the country. So it's actually not as direct to IOC as one would think. So each country is allotted a certain amount to obviously, you know, manage crowds uh, and that sort of thing. And then within the partner country or host nation, they have control over that data. So we're actually in the process of collaborating to co have connectivity with that, but they don't tell us in progress, they tell us as it's closer to the date. So it's not like right now I could go into our database and look at specifically ticketing. Um, that would have to be something they release to us based on our like future analysis. So they wouldn't give it to us now. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that, that's clear. Yeah. I'm always curious about how much, uh, say, data a governing body and the IOC is you know, potentially the world's largest governing body of sport in, in that respect how much you actually, how many insights you can actually provide, you know, to potential partners or people that want to collaborate with you in order to achieve, you know, the, the objectives of, of the IOC, whether that's, you know, globally or locally or, you know, for a specific target group. So for that, that's a little different. Um, sorry, I, I guess maybe I misunderstood in terms of who's registering for ticketing, but then in terms of our commercial partners that require that because that ends up being three different people, right? No, I, so, I just chose tickets as an example, but of course yeah, uh, okay. I was talking in a more you know, generic sense originally in terms of, you know, what you do or what you don't, um, you know, have legitimate access to. Ah, uh, okay. So for that, then yes. So like actual tickets for the event, that's separate than what we do with our commercial partners. Because, for instance, um, some of our key commercial partners are like Bridgestone, Toyota, Samsung, um, and that sort of thing. And we're, we're literally in the process. We had um, a meeting uh, yesterday and today with Samsung in coordinating how to track the data. Because, for example, they want to get um, age demographics. And as you know, legally, we can't pinpoint specific ages, those kind of things. So we have to give a range. Or in some cases, if you are getting that data, it's very, very minimal because not that many people are releasing all of those details. And also it's not a prerequisite in order to be uh, signed up or part of uh, our tracking for sign up. The information that we request, like your uh, user ID, um, your email, um, we try not to collect all of those other things that could be looked at as more risky. Uh, so we have to let them know, okay, in terms of demographics, these are the kinds of things we can give you. Mm, sometimes gender, uh, that's being becoming a little bit trickier nowadays, but also ranges of age for demographics. So it really depends, but they tend to do a lot of their work, our commercial partners tend to do a lot of their work based on um, regional differences. So they're going to have campaigns. Um, our marketing team is going to have a campaign that's more specific to a region because you have to take into account what you're doing for an audience that's more, um, I would say, like maybe like an American audience versus uh, the Southeast Asian Pacific. So things like that. You have to give them data that they can then um, infer certain things like you infer this region is using this information between these hours so you get peak times that's useful information to drive campaigns then you can also use things like um, language what language is being shown in these regions and then you can also track consumption of these languages so then that can also help you tailor um, your work okay. as yeah, I get the picture. Yeah, thank you. Uh, interesting. So, uh, Ardul Jermain from Atlanta, he has a question as well. Uh, Jermain, would you like to go ahead or should I uh, read out your question? All right, uh, it's okay. I'll read out. So, uh, Jermain has asked, uh, without going into too much detail about your personal situation, 
how would you say that salaries in sports compare to the other industries that you have worked in? Because from his little experience with the sporting industry in Atlanta, he saw a trade-off in the salary for careers in sports. Ah, okay. So I'm not familiar with Atlanta, but um, it really depends on the organization that you go for. So if you go for a professional sports team, um, you need to be mindful of how their financial situation is, um, also how the organization's salary is. So for instance, NFL will be notoriously um, varied in salary because of that. Um, what team is doing better? Your salary is going to be completely different if you're working for the Giants versus if you're working for, I don't know, Miami Dolphins, right? And then also seasonally, it depends on the season. But for me specifically, because I'm in an organization that's linked to an international organization, um, it's different. I, from what I've seen, um, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, and then also the country that you're in, you have to take that into account because there will be certain perks to it. So for instance, like meals, transit, gym, that, that stuff that they compensate based on your package as well. In the US, the idea that I would have a job that pays for my gym, all my meals, and uh, not all my meals, but like um, gives me meals for my working uh, arrangement, that would be pretty hard to find. So I think look at the organization. Also because I know if maybe I worked at FIFA, the salary would be significantly more, right? Because FIFA is notoriously far, like more funded for those kinds of things. But that's just also an assumption. It also depends on what tier you go in. As a manager, you want to definitely uh, try to request the salary that you think makes the most sense overall, not just for your company, but also um, an organization that makes sense for it too. So I, because I, I went to undergrad at Rutgers and I had a lot of friends who ended up going into um, the sports world as well because of their athletic backgrounds. Um, and from what I understood, when you work at a certain tier in the NFL, it's low paid because they want you to be there for the, the passion and everything. But then once you get up in management, the bonuses, the salaries, easily six figures. But you may not anticipate that in every organization. Like I'm, I don't think you could maybe ask that of, um, I, I don't know, like a rugby organization. I, I don't know. So Jermaine yeah. mentioned that his experience was with the NFL and that's what kind of dissuaded him from strongly pursuing a career in sports. Okay. Yeah. I, I would look at a different organization. Yeah. So um, I had a question. So generally when we look at sporting bodies and sporting organizations, they have been established from a very long time, be it FIFA or be it any football club or be it, let's say, the you know, cricket boards of different uh, countries or hockey boards. You mentioned that the current uh, job that you're in, the, uh, the Olympic channel, right, the data analytics, you said that the structure is more like a startup. So that was a pleasant surprise when I heard that. So how would you, you know, like, if you had to uh, say if there are any major differences of you know a structured organization that we see generally in sports versus what you're doing right now. What you know how the how is the management different? How is your your job role different? How is your approach different to your your works and other people? That's a great question. Um, I would say that because we are going back from 2016 with our data we have a certain i would say like excitement about what we can 
figure out in that short amount of time. Um, specifically when you're talking about how to enhance our content, because maybe a series has only been aired and in use for six months and you're trying to extrapolate a conclusion from that. So you have more flexibility to fight for certain um, initiatives or fight for different types of content because what, what's the counter? You can't prove that it hasn't worked so well. All you can say is that for a couple of months, it may not have worked well, right? So then that gives people a lot more flexibility to create um, more and also put in processes that are more conducive to what they're identifying. So one of the tasks that I'm uh, faced with right now uh, that's pretty time consuming, it's actually a big part of the organization, is to really structure how our data visualization is set up in the organization for everyone. And I was like, okay, but haven't you guys been doing this for a couple of years? Why do you need it restructured? And they're like, well, we can always make it better. It's going well, but we can always make it better. And that conversation you don't typically have in organizations that are longstanding. You have the conversation of, this is how it works. This is what we do. And if you have a challenge to it, it's a different uh, battle. But in this organization, it's more, how do you think it should work? What would work? So I think that's very encouraging and it allows you to, you know, take more initiative. It allows you to say what's on your mind because you don't really think that it's going to be a terrible idea because what else, what else is everyone doing, <laughs> you know? So that's the exciting part. But it can be a bit stressful because um, coming from an organization where I knew even down to how structured our PowerPoint slides should be for every kind of like uh, media release. There's not one single Facebook post, not one single PowerPoint presentation, not one single whatever that we don't have to get checked through and go through, uh, you know, our SOPs to ensure that it's consistent with what we do. Here, we do have like standards of how we disseminate our products, but if something works better in a certain style, we'll do it. We'll see how it works and then it'll become what we do. But that can be stressful if you're not willing to go for all those iterations because it could take three or four iterations when you may be used to just walking into the scenario where you know what to do. Thank you, Ardu. Uh, if anybody else has any further questions, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, Stuart, how are uh, you? Hi, I'm good. So if, if Ramji has another question, then I, I can no, ask. Yeah, okay, you can go for it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I've sort of crammed a couple of questions in, uh, but I mean, sort of the, broadly speaking, where does all of your data come from? Because I know sort of from personal experience, I registered with the, on, the, on the Olympic channel and you set sort of sport preferences and sort of some basic personal data, but where i mean do you do sort of additional sort of social data mining or uh sort of other ways to analyze sort of the viewing figures or do you outsource it there's a lot of obviously uh data companies out there now doing all these services and it's a separate question uh but sort of with a with a connection how much data can you or do you share with the international federations because presumably a lot of commercial partners may sort of specify or want certain sports or sort of the viewers from certain sports may be a better match for, for their products and equally for international federations a lot of them don't have the same sort of resources that, that the IOC has to invest in all of this sort of data analytics and, and sort of an Olympic channel uh, and obviously that data could therefore be very useful for international federations to understand who's what their sports and sort of help them approach commercial partners uh, sort of on their side so <laughs> sort of uh, I've lumped a few questions in there but I mean the first one in terms of where does all the data come from sort of what is it that, that's uh, sort of let's start start there okay <laughs> all right so um, 
it's great to hear that you signed up and I encourage all of you to <laughs> um, because that actually is how we get information on how to make better content. I mean, if we can't tell that people are connecting with it in different stages, then we don't know if it's working. So just because you click and we can track a page view or a video view or an app download, we don't know what you're doing until we continue that second step. So then um, we also track things like heartbeats. So you have a video and it could last one minute, but you want to track at what point is the drop off? Because you want to know if people are watching it to its entirety or if it's because they log off after um, a certain point in the program or after they see an ad, right? So you also have to give that information to our commercial partners because if Bridgestone finds out that on our program for all around, people log off after 20 seconds. So after one and a half heartbeats, they're going to want to pay more for an ad that comes before then, in theory, right? Yeah. They would say like, don't, don't sell me anything at one minute, you know, 10 seconds if people log off at 20, right? Um, so the anticipation is that we get the data from how people navigate on our pages, um, how long they stay, how they download, frequency of download as well. Um, and that gives us a lot of information. And that's what we share with our commercial partners. So commercial partners versus I guess maybe what you're also describing are like other organizations like FIFA, NBA, whatever. Um, we, we don't really have that uh, connectivity with like NBA or anything like that. Um, but in terms of our commercial partners, we actually design specific dashboards for them to consume the data in a way that's relevant for them because we have several different ones. So it's not necessary for Toyota to get information about Bridgestone and vice versa, or for Samsung, or for um, any, you know, PNG. So we have specified ones that are tailored towards whatever campaigns that they may have. So we track the campaigns as well within our content. So we have trackers specified and in a way that is translatable to us. And so you know who's consuming what. And then we can translate that into insights. So we can tell them um, your ad is doing very well in, um, I guess, a certain region of the world. Um, you should continue with it. They can make that inference, but that's the kind of information we give them. Specifically, there are also different periods. So we have longstanding commercial partners who are legacy. So like P&G, uh, Bridgestone, and I believe Toyota. But then there are other ones that are a little bit newer to the game and want specific things during games time. And that's different. So we give them different reports for that as well. So does that mean that the, the people that watch, because you can, I mean, I, I, I registered, but I mean, I, I don't really recall there being much of a difference between registering and not registering in terms of access to the content. So all the people who haven't registered, I mean, can you actually get sort of useful information, insights from people who haven't registered or watching all these videos? Where does that come from if it's just, a, just an IP address? So uh, it's kind of a mix. So we can get an idea on what you're consuming as, um, we'll say somebody who has registered, right? And then some of the preferences, like the videos that will load or that kind of information will change over time, but it has to be developed as well um, by your usage. So that would also help with tailoring. And we have systems as well that are um, in place that are kind of referenced as like genes. So we can have information about users who consume a certain type of content. So that's how we also navigate that so we track a cluster of behavior and that gives us insight as well even if you don't register 
So you mean, so you'll you'll still know it's the same user coming back because of the IP address and then it's still a behavior of a certain, or is it? Is it? Mm, we only know returned users um, by uh, their, their sign up because it, we do anonymous IDs. So you're anonymous when you, you search the content. Mm -hmm. And do you do any other, once people have read, I mean, is there any sort of social data mining on sort of how many times yeah. people have mentioned a campaign or, or whatever? Yeah. Is any of that then, can you link that back to people who have registered or do you just have to take? The, well, so, um, in a way, yes. Um, so we have a third party organization that we connect to their social data API and that's how we gather all the information um, for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, and some other ones that aren't as popular. And then we can make our inferences from the tracked content for that. And you can also personally connect to your own Facebook API to track like your usage of it. And you can see how, <laughs> if you're ever curious, you can always connect on your own and see like how your usage is going in the social media. If you wanted to play around and learn a little bit on that level. How do you mean it tracks what my own usage just to tell me what I've been clicking on and okay. Yeah. See like your, your patterns and stuff like that. Okay, so that would basically be telling me the same organizations that are doing the social data mining, essentially. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you for your question, Stuart. Um, yeah, so we have Yusuf Kamel, who is uh, currently an undergraduate student studying here at IE. Uh, he's studying information systems. So his question is that he actually hopes to go and work in sports when he graduates. Do you think this is a viable option or is it somewhat of a niche market and your case is considered as an exception? Mm, that's a fair question. That's definitely fair. Um, I was super, um, I don't like to say lucky because that, that implies that I didn't do anything, but um, I was in the right place at the right time doing the, the right things. Um, I think for Yusuf, the most important thing to do is to surround himself by exactly what he says he wants to do. So if that means you're joining an extracurricular, if that means you're joining a club that's based in Madrid, that is like for uh, athletes who you know, are interested in exploring that field, do things that consistently reaffirm your connectivity to the sports world. And the reason why I say that is, one, I always was told growing up, think of what you want, manifest it and all of that. But people usually don't say the second part to that, which is think about what you want and manifest it and into action. So be, being around sports and talking about sports makes your circle, your, your network, your contacts, sports oriented. And so for me, I helped coordinate MBAT, which is like the Olympics for MBA students. So I surrounded myself around sports. And even though I didn't get the job through that connection, when I was interviewing with the Olympics and I told them, I literally just went and organized at MBA Olympics, the connectivity was there. So that's what that means by manifesting it because it kept bringing itself back and made sense to people who were then talking to me about it. And also when, for instance, they came to campus and I was talking with them, I had more to talk about. And then there was a connection and then it made sense to continue the conversation. And then they reached out to me later on to say, hey, are you still interested in a job? When are you free? And it was boom, 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 boom. So those are things that I, I stress because it's really useful and it may seem like nothing,
but it will pay off in dividends later on because if imagine you really are passionate about sports but you consistently go to you know i i don't know finance or like pet stuff or like animal stuff and you go to an interview and now you're talking about completely opposite thing how do they see the connection especially for me who didn't have like an obvious sports background they were trying to see okay why would she want to be here why would yusuf want to be here if he's you know talking about something completely different so it's important to do that for yourself as well So that is something that actually happened with me while I was giving my IE interview. So the person who was interviewing me, he turned out to be a Barcelona fan. And the end of the last, like the, the 20 minutes of the, the interview, the final 20 minutes, we were just discussing about the football club, you know, the, the bad performances, the good performances, what to do. So that turned from an IE interview about, uh, for my admission to this university to something else entirely. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I have an additional question, which is, you've worked for US Homeland Security, you've worked for IBM, and right now you are with the International Olympic Channel. So according to you, which of these skills, which of these, you know, skills are transferable from the jobs that you've seen to the current job that you're in? Yeah. Um, so the, the IBM position was actually while I was a student and it was a consulting project. Um, but the reason why that made sense was because in all of the jobs that I've done, I've always been the connection between the technical part and the business part. So I learned skills like being organized with processes and plans. And that's why I was saying criminal justice and psychology may not have seemed like an obvious connection, but the amount of reading and analysis that you have to do in the social sciences makes reading like a case brief super easy. I mean, it, you go from 50 pages per subject to a 10, maybe max 15 page brief. And it completely changes the game for you. Um, one thing that I've seen consistently is also the liaison position with different uh, like departments. So all of my jobs, I never worked isolated in just my department. I had to communicate with legal or with HR or with IT or, or something. And then that meant that I knew a little bit about how everything worked. I didn't know everything super well, but I knew a, enough to one, be able to find the answer. So then you end up looking like, oh, wow, she, she always has the answer or she at least knows who to go ask because you're involved in multiple things. In DHS, I, I liaised with different agencies even. Um, and even in my roles in New York, I liaised with different universities and different schools to get projects done. And so then that always kept me in a circular position inside of the organization. So try not to stay in just one um, department, unless obviously your work really calls for that, but try to connect with the other departments in what you're doing because it will also make your organization far more efficient. Thank you, Ardu. Uh, Edo, can you hear? Like, uh, Wamsi here. Uh, I have a question like, uh, like from your experiences, what do you think is one of the major pain points or the challenges that the sports industry as an overall uh, overall industry, what do you think is uh, is the industry facing right now? Uh, apart from COVID and stuff, yeah. uh, what do you think? What are the skills that the industry right now needs? Like, what what are the things we can we as uh, next graduates can try to learn and try to solve those problems? Uh, one thing would one. It's a great question because um, it will be very important to think proactively, like how do you add value 
to these organizations because, I mean, in my situation, uh, Olympic Channel has only been around for a couple of years, but maybe you're really passionate about football and you want to go to FIFA, or maybe you're very passionate about um, tennis or, you know, golf. So you should also do a little bit of analysis of what that field is aiming towards and angling towards. So if it's gaming, like, okay, maybe you learn a little bit more about how they're using uh, gamification in, in the sports, whether that's, you know, in apps or whatever, learn a little bit about that. But specifically in the sports in general, I would say that it's important to figure out how data answers business questions for the decision makers. That is something that I keep seeing um, over and over again. So it's easy to be really attracted by the shiny metrics or the shiny data, like, oh, we have a million viewers for this program. But you need to also decide, is that what the business strategy is for that organization, to only have people view the content? Or is it to have people um, download or make purchases or do a secondary step like sign up or you you get what i'm saying so it's very important to like try to identify how does this organization need my skills maybe you're not strong in data maybe you're really strong in the project management side so how do they need more organization is it because they have several different um partner organizations spread out and you want to find a better system for them to connect? Um, is it also an environmental thing? Maybe some of these organizations need a closer look at the environmental implications of their sport. Maybe that's a way for you to contribute. Or even legally, how, for instance, is GDPR changing um, some of these organizations? How do you fit in with that? Maybe you have a psychology background and you want to think, okay, how do we manage something with athletes so that we can have a better relationship with them in the long run? Or even marketing. How do you help an organization like FIFA with their marketing? What's the trend? Is it something that they need to be aware of? What have you done in your past that could help? Yeah, Brilliant. thank you so much. Yeah, got it. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question if there's, if there's an opportunity. Uh, I was wondering really sort of what are the, the trends at the moment? I mean, you're able to give us a few sort of insights. I know there's been some talk with the Olympics in terms of sort of worry that they're not attracting sort of the younger generations as much and a bit of a push to try and get that uh, get sort of the younger generations back involved and that's also sort of been reflected in some of the new sports and bringing in esports and things into the Olympic movement so sort of off the back of that what is, what are the main trends and how much is the data and the trends used for the commercial purpose in terms of attracting and sort of linking up with the commercial partners and how much is it being used to actually drive the business strategy, sort of which sports to attract, how to actually develop the the IOC, the Olympics, as a brand and as an actual an actual business. Um, great question. Um, one thing I've noticed actually, and I think it's public, so I don't think I'm spilling anything. But there's a push to have the engagement with your your phones, like with Samsung. So an initiative is it's called like that Zen. D-A-Z-N, um, where you can actually, like in different locations, when you use the phone, you're like seeing a display of a different sport or something. I, I forget. There's like so many different campaigns, but I would encourage you to look that up. But so there's a push towards the mobile and app involvement. Um, but one of the concerns that is going around is how do you make that content really fresh? Because one, people are on their mobiles the whole day, basically. And this is even before um, 
our imposed uh, quarantine. So people need something that brings them back because you're competing with, you know, the, the NFL, NBA, you know, Major League Baseball. You're competing with a lot of different things. And I think the big misconception is that the Olympics only has, you know, the season of when the Olympics is going on. That's not true. They have all their, their world events, the world qualifiers. So like boxing was a big push. So the trend has been to make people more aware of the events that lead to the Olympics. Um, I don't know how many of you were familiar with the boxing qualifiers that were happening from February all the way into uh, late. Well, yeah, I guess it only went into the first or second week of March and then the rest were canceled. Um, but that was a big initiative and was one of the first times that we had the rights uh, holder broadcasting for that. So trying to make it more of an event, a leading up, like ramping people up to the event. So I would say mobile as well as lead up events um, as ten, tends to be more of the trend right now. And but it could change as well. That's how trends are. They could change. <laughs> are there particular trends in terms of the actual viewer type, sort of age, uh, whether gender, nationality, anything like that? I mean, I know the host nation tends to get a lot more sort of traction sort of in the years before they, they host. But other than that, what are there specific trends in terms of the Olympic movement seeing an older generation or younger generation or specific sports even that are particularly pulling people in and others which are sort of falling by the wayside because I know a lot of sports dream of getting into the Olympics but some of the sort of less mainstream ones they get in expecting suddenly their sport to explode and sort of nothing changes so I'd just be interested to know if sort of how the figures of those sort of more fringe sports within the Olympics actually whether they bring traction to the IOC and to the Olympic movement or or not particularly. Um, I don't have a ton of visibility on like the overarching themes, but I do know specific examples um, because we just went, well, we, not just, but in January, it was Youth Olympic Games that was hosted in Lausanne, Switzerland. And that was pulling a younger demographic for obvious reasons, because it's youth. Um, but we also did have a substantial amount of people watching none other than curling. People love curling. Behind figure skating, curling is really popular. So we jumped on that trend and that started to push more of like our awareness and the views um, and that sort of thing. So it was really fascinating because we were all like, curling? Like, we have people on the half pipe, we have, you know, all these skiers, and it's curling. So that's something that's super interesting to keep um, people, like, aware of that. And that wasn't even a sport that people were saying, hey, this is a fringe sport, we really want it to take flight. It was more of, like, whoa, did you know that that fringe sport is taking flight? So being vigilant of stuff like that, because it really... You have about three weeks, three weeks to capture everything in that time. Obviously, we still show programs later on, but when it's hot and when it's active is in the span of the games time. So that was really interesting. Um, in terms of demographics, is it harder getting different demographics? Yes and no, but also host nations, like you said, tend to be the larger pool. Um, and then also Americans watch a, a lot of uh, the sports. So it's, it's good to know that, but then also it's a little bit different because of how um, broadcasting rights are a little bit different with the American audience versus here because of all the different regulations. So it, it's tricky because you can obviously see that the consumption is higher, but then you should also do a secondary analysis to see which sports are they watching, which we tend to also find that it tends to be 
um, sports that are more focused or popular in that nation to begin with. So like, you know, football isn't super popular stateside. So you will notice that there's not that much more football consumption um, in U.S., even though U.S. trends higher. But when specific games happen, we also try to do predictive analysis. So um, for certain events, you want to try and gauge what's the audience viewership going to be like in this country or that country when both of their teams are playing a certain sport. Because then you also have to rank that sport. Because so if it's um, ice hockey, ice hockey is pretty popular sport overall in Winter Olympics. But if you're showing ice hockey and the Italian team is playing, uh, what should you should definitely tailor or manage your expectations on what the audience is going to be like, because, like you know, what are you expecting from that, right? So. <laughs> cool. Thanks. You're welcome. So, just a fun fact. I don't think people know this, but India has a ice hockey team as well. <laughs> Whoa! Yes. <laughs> People do not know this, but the Indian national ice hockey team exists and it practices as well. I don't think they have had that many games uh, as <laughs> such. Like I have never seen them, but I know this fact for a fact. Uh, one more question that we have is uh, coming from Julio. Sorry, I'm so sorry, Julio. So he says, "Hi, Urdu. I am a karate coach and part of the Spanish Karate Federation." He would like your opinion as an Olymp Olympic media expert. What do you think karate should do in Tokyo 2021 to become more attractive to the open public and sponsors? Oof. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That, that's quite, quite a loaded question. Um, I should say the disclaimer that I, I don't know uh, the karate audience that well. So I don't know <laughs> particularly... Um, how to engage your audience per se, but just in general, this is me personally, not representing the Olympics um, stance because I don't think they have a clear one on, on karate, but I would say to try to reach your audience where they are. So if that's more of a mobile, more digital audience, I would push for that. And then also like jump on trends that are happening now. Um, for instance, like Instagram, people love looking at pictures and quick videos. You could also do like TikTok, you know, raising awareness about it on the platform that people are going to be on anyway. Um, you might as well engage them there. Um, and then also in terms of how to get more awareness, it really also depends on what is the, the goal for your marketing. Do you have a budget that would enable you to reach an audience beyond what your current scope is. Maybe that's why it hasn't changed as much because of that limitation. Um, but definitely, I would say iron out and determine who you're trying to um, attract. And then that would also shape your approach. Because if you want to get a younger audience, that would mean you probably need to evaluate is this accessible to younger audiences in like their environments, whether that's um, uh, youth organizations, if that's in schools, if that's in clubs. But if you're going for an older audience, then maybe you go for like branding in a more gym or a fitness initiative or a lifestyle approach. Um, you know, so that should also be something that you take into account. It's like, Maybe look to who you're trying to attract first and then build your strategy that way. Because uh, if you try to catch everything, <laughs> you may catch nothing, right? Thank you for your input, Urdu. Okay. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Uh, so I have a question that is for a newcomer who's trying to enter the world of sports, what would be your advice? Mm. As in, let's say there uh, are people who are passionate 
right? But they mm-hmm. have a separate set of work experience. So what would you g- give an advice to them? Um, so I would say first try to look at the kind of organization that you would want to be a part of. If it's literally a professional team, like maybe your dream is to work for Real Madrid, then I would say, you know, look at what avenues you could enter there with your current skill set and then try to build a strategy that way because it's it's much harder to reinvent the wheel um, than to tune it up, right? So I had data analytics background, data analytics experience, but I hadn't worked for a, a sports organization. So you have to bridge the gap. My bridge to the gap, as I mentioned with Zeta, your bridge to the gap depends on what you do well, like something that is a strong suit because you don't want to try to lean on something that you don't actually know so well either. So if your strong suit is maybe writing, try to lean in on, on that aspect in how that organization uses writers, right? Or like journalists or something like that. Um, if it's... Um, I don't know, maybe finance, look at how finance connects in that organization and try to do a leg in that way. Or even engineering, how do they use engineers within that organization and then connect the dots there. I would say try to reach out to alumni, try to attend events. Maybe they have some talks going on, particularly now everybody's so much online. Try to engage that way. Give them a reason to want to um, reach out to you because they see the passion and luckily all of you who are so interested in sports sports recognizes passion that is not the case with a lot of other organizations like maybe banking or finance if you went in and you're like i'm passionate about me i'm passionate about finance they'd be like okay but with sports they love it and you can totally talk about it without it even being part of what you are you know, tasked with for your job, right? So during Youth Olympic Games, well, literally during any time, you're in the office and you see a game playing. We can watch Federer, we can watch, you know, Serena, we can watch all kinds of different sports going on as as they're feeding into the Olympic movement because it's like maybe it's a world championship or something. So make sure that you try to engage in the way that makes sense for you and, and show your passion. Don't be afraid to like go ahead and say, yeah, I'm a Barcelona fan like you did the races. You know, like definitely brand yourself as as that sports person so that when people think of you, they connect it right away. Even if you don't have another way of connecting it besides your passion, because that that's strong enough in sports industry. Thank you. Uh, on a side note, I would be ready to pay hundred dollars to a person who says he's passionate in banking or corporate because i've never met anybody <laughs> exactly. uh, so going to your point about sports journalism uh yusuf mentioned a point that he had never like uh first of all he thanks uh, you for your comments uh he actually did start working part-time for a sports journalism writing uh he was writing articles and he says uh, he will definitely try and do that in a more intense manner in the coming future and he thanks you for all your friends. Yeah, uh, that's great to hear. And also he could try to maybe write an article demonstrating his interest and send it to one of his favorite organizations and see if they bite, you know. Show them what you're doing already. That, yeah, that's actually a, yeah, that's actually a good uh, input as well. Um, so, guys, thank you everybody for attending this event. I hope you have been able to uh, get valuable insights from our dear speaker, Ardu. Ms. Ardu. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Ardu, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and, th- and thank you so much for this entire event. Uh, we hope that, we hope, and thank you everybody to the participants as well. We hope that we've been able to provide some good inputs. And if you have any other further questions, you can either email me or you can, uh, uh, email Urdu as well, Urdu, if you'd, if you'd be kind enough to share your email address, if that's not an issue with you. Yeah, or find me on LinkedIn. I yeah, also have a as well. there too. Yeah. 
thank you everybody thank you Stuart and every other uh, Yusuf uh, Julio and every other person who had the questions and uh, sorry Jermaine as well for making the session interesting and we hope that we'll be coming to you next week with another event as well thank you everybody thank you Urdu so much for headlining this event thanks guys bye bye, bye. Thank you. Okay, connect with you on LinkedIn bye. Okay. bye thank you so much have a good day bye